Hey, it's the Adam Ragusea Podcast, episode seven, available for free wherever you download pod. And I was just thinking about cotton candy, or a candy floss, it is often called outside the United States. I have some right here because I just went to a fair. It is pink. And I've always wondered, how is it that this tastes like cotton candy and not like sugar? I mean, it's just sugar with pink food dye in it and maybe some artificial fruity flavors, but mostly it's just sugar. And yet, it doesn't taste like sugar. I mean, you've tasted sugar, right? Like a you know, spoonful of white table sugar, sucrose. It doesn't taste like this. And yet, this is pretty much just sugar going by the recipes that I've consulted and uh, ingredient labels of cotton candy mixes that I have been looking up on the internet. So what is going on? Why does this taste like cotton candy and not like sugar, given that it's, uh, you know, sugar? Delicious pink sugar. Well, to my surprise, cotton candy machines get hotter than I had realized. A cotton candy machine is basically just a pot that melts your sugar down into a syrup and then it spins. And the power of angular momentum forces the syrup through some tiny little holes. Syrup comes out as threads and it instantly cools down and solidifies due to all of the surface area that it suddenly now has. And there you've got your candy floss. Anyway, I've been looking at recipes you know, and product manuals for cotton candy machines. And yeah, they seem to get hot enough to caramelize the sugar. You get sugar hot enough, the oxygen and the carbon and the hydrogen atoms break apart and lots of the oxygen and the hydrogen form water and evaporate. And then what's left reforms as all kinds of crazy molecules that collectively taste like caramel. And also uh, air affects how we taste stuff. Air affects taste perception a lot. Lots of research about that. We should talk about more another day. But anyway, caramel plus lots of air around it equals cotton candy flavor. But what is cotton candy flavor in quotation marks? Cotton candy flavor in things that are not actually cotton candy. Things like chewing gum and vape juice, or whatever other junk is marketed as being cotton candy flavor. What is that? Well, some cursory Google Scholar search informs me that it is generally maltol, specifically ethyl maltol. Maltol is a naturally occurring arrangement of, you know, carbon and oxygen and hydrogen and all that stuff that is, uh, it's found in roasted malt, i.e. roasted sprouted grain. Ethyl maltol is kind of similar, but it tastes six times more intense, and it is not naturally occurring. It is said to have a flavor like fruity caramelized sugar, i.e. like cotton candy. So now I know that cotton candy does not taste like sugar. It tastes like ethyl maltol, even though it isn't ethyl maltol. It is caramel with lots of air around it. Anyway, today on the pod, we are doing Ask Adam. Harmony Bat asks, why does every cookware instruction manual want me to cook on low or medium low, maybe medium if I get really wild, while at the same time, every recipe seems to be like preheat your pan in the hottest part of the sun for a week. <laughs> so to restate, Harmony is observing that Pan manufacturers tend to recommend very moderate heat, while recipe writers tend to recommend the highest heat you can possibly muster in your kitchen. What's up with the apparent contradiction? So first, let us consider the point of view of the cookware manufacturers. I think it's important to remember that most people who buy a pan are not going to read the instruction manual. It's like reading the instruction manual for shoes. Like, you know what to do with them. <laughs> Most people who buy a pan are not going to read the instruction manual, and the manufacturers surely know this. The instruction manual is there to be entered into evidence in litigation proceedings. <laughs> it is a, a CYA document. Cover your ass. It's a place where you advocate 
the most cautious, conservative use of your product you can imagine. So when somebody has a bad experience doing something perhaps less cautious with your product, you can say, hey, look, that's, that's not what we advised in the instruction manual. Don't sue us. <laughs> Here's a slightly less cynical read on that concept. With mass production comes mass responsibility. I feel that in my production of mass media on YouTube, or you could call it uh, micro mass media in this era of micro celebrity. When I am making how to videos about food, I often issue advice. Sometimes it's just implicit advice, but I issue advice that is overly cautious. And yes, in part, I do that because when I'm writing my scripts late at night, I hear my lawyer's voice in my head and I don't want to get sued. But it's also just because I feel the weight of responsibility on me. I don't want to get anyone hurt, especially young people. And like most online content creators, I have an audience that is pretty young in aggregate. I will give you an example. In a recent video I made about uh, alcohol distillation, I distilled like 10 milliliters of booze and other volatiles out of a glass of wine. I did this for purely educational purposes and I discarded the resulting product. I emphasized that ethanol or drinking alcohol is not the only volatile substance that boils out of wine at low temperatures. There are other things, notably methanol, which is metabolized in the body into formaldehyde and then into formic acid, which is an incredibly potent poison, deadly in quantities as small as 30 mils of pure methanol. And in the video, I said... I'm going to throw this distillate away. I'm not going to drink it. Because the distillate was so small, I was not able to make a head cut from it. A head cut is when distillers throw away the first bits of distillate that condense out of the pot. Because that's where most of the methanol is. Methanol is just like ethanol, except it has one carbon atom surrounded by hydrogen instead of two. Ethanol has two. Methanol is the smaller molecule lower molecular weight, it's more volatile than ethanol, so methanol evaporates first at those lower temperatures. That's why you can get rid of most of the methanol by making a head cut, by throwing away the first little bit that comes out of the condenser. My little purely educational distilling setup was so tiny that my distillate got stuck in my condensing tube. The tube was full but the distillate wasn't pouring out. I think it was an air pressure issue. There just wasn't enough fluid to push past an air bubble that was in the line. Could also have been a surface tension thing, but anyway, I literally had to suck on the tip of the condenser to get my moonshine to start flowing out. And when it did, it all came pouring out at once and there was no way for me to make a head cut. Everything was suddenly just in my receiver cup all at once. Methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol, some water, and all those other uh, so-called congeners that come out when you do the first distillation of some wine. Congeners are the things other than ethanol and water that come out. Do they consider water to be a congener? I don't know. Anyway, some water comes out too in a first distillation. Actually, in the last distillation too. You can never get out all of the water. If you do get out all the water by some pretty intense processes, the result is what they call anhydrous ethanol or anhydrous as I have pronounced it in the past and people give me heck about that. But anyways, as I said in the video about distillation, I said, I'm throwing this distillate, this booze away because it has methanol in it and methanol is poisonous. But I was being overly cautious what did I start with? I started with a single glass of wine. <laughs> There's no more methanol in my distillate than there was in that glass of wine from whence it came. And I drink glasses of wine all the time without going blind or dying. 
I often drink significantly more than a single glass of wine in one sitting, and I have not as yet gone blind or died. That's because there's only a few milligrams of methanol in a glass of wine. Maybe 20 milligrams of methanol would be more dangerous if consumed in a concentrated form in a distillate rather than diluted in a whole glass of wine. I can't think of why that would be the case, but chemistry is weird. Maybe that's a thing. I went looking for some science on that subject and could not find anything, but you know, biology is weird. Chemistry is weird. Sometimes counterintuitive things end up being true. I doubt it in this case. (laughs) I think that if I had knocked back all of those 10 mils of moonshine, I doubt it would have hurt me any more than if I had knocked back the whole glass of wine from whence it came. Things get a lot more dangerous when you are distilling on an actual production scale. I speak to you now from the mountains of East Tennessee, a historic epicenter of illegal alcohol production, aka bootlegging. Thunder Road is like an hour's drive from my house. There's a movie with Robert Mitchum called Thunder Road about bootlegging. Anyway, the actual danger with methanol is that Robert Mitchum and his buddies up in the Smokies, they're going to be making their you know bathtub room or whatever it is, and they're just going to fill up bottles for sale straight out of their condenser tube. Like stuff condenses, it goes straight into the bottle, they ball it up, they start filling up another bottle. And if you are the unlucky person who buys one of the bottles they filled up early in that distillation run, you could get a bottle that is like all head, no heart, meaning you get a full bottle that is nothing but the first, you know, I don't know, 1% of the distillation run, which could have a very high methanol concentration, totally enough to blind you or kill you. That's the danger. In contrast, if you distilled a whole pot's worth of molasses wash or wine or whatever it is, if you distilled the whole pot and then you mixed all of the resulting distillate together before bottling, the situation would be much less dangerous. Even if you didn't make a head cut, the head would be distributed across the rest of the moonshine evenly. So the resulting methanol concentration might be high enough to give you a headache, give you a terrible hangover, which is something bad moonshine is reputed to do for this very reason, but it might not be enough to blind you or kill you. I don't know for sure. Don't take my word on it. I am no expert on the bootlegging arts and sciences. I was... Nonetheless, I think being quite overly cautious in my vid about distillation because I don't want to get sued, but more importantly, because I actually don't want to inspire someone to do something that gets them hurt. That weight of responsibility sits heavily when you are talking to hundreds of thousands of young people, some of whom might go and do a much more extreme version of the thing that you did, and they end up getting themselves hurt. All of this is to say, Harmony, that when pen manufacturers tell you to use moderate heat with their products, I suspect that they are being overly cautious. Bad things absolutely can happen when you use very high heat with certain pans. Cheaper, thinner pans are more likely to warp in response to heavy thermal stress. Uh, You could scorch the pan, you know, burn food into it such that the metal is permanently or semi-permanently discolored. Barkeeper's friend, by the way, great for cleaning scorched pans. Just make sure you wash it out really thoroughly after you're done. The manufacturers of nonstick pans will absolutely advise to never go beyond medium heat. And that's for good reasons. Teflon will start to off-gas potentially dangerous chemicals, somewhere around 500 Fahrenheit, 260 C. Gases released by those temperatures could absolutely kill your pet bird. (laughs) And that's a thing that happens. Birds have extremely sensitive respiratory systems. This is pure speculation on my part, but I wonder if maybe this is because in the wild, birds are able to fly away and escape bad air really easily. And thus they have had no reason to evolve a respiratory system that is tolerant of bad air. Um, anyway, it can absolutely kill birds. 
Human respiratory systems are far more resilient, but even we can suffer what is called polymer fume fever if we get like a giant lungful of vaporizing Teflon. The advice to never use Teflon over high heat is, I think, good advice for the general public, <laughs> which includes people who do not know what they are doing in the kitchen. If you do know what you're doing in the kitchen, I think you absolutely can use a Teflon pan over high heat, but you only use the high heat while the pan is full of stuff. If the pan is full of food, wet food, that water is going to absorb that heat long before enough heat can build up in the Teflon to vaporize it. An empty Teflon pan over high heat, that is dangerous. A full pan is Probably not. All of the documented cases of pan-related polymer fume fever that I have been able to find, they all happened when somebody left an empty pan over high heat for a long time. Or it might not have been empty at first, but they left it and everything boiled out and then it became empty and then it, it overheated. And those, that's, those are the documented cases of polymer fume fever. Some people will say that you can't really trust that because... Polymer fume fever just kind of feels like a, a flu um, or, I don't know, COVID these days. And so people maybe wouldn't know that they had it when they had it. So there's probably lots of undocumented cases. But of like the serious ones that get documented because people go to the hospital, all the case reports that I've ever been able to find, they involve somebody cooking something with an empty pan, like water. All the water boils out, pan goes empty, pan overheats, boom. But even now, I am nervous that somebody could listen to this podcast and find some way to hurt themselves with a Teflon pan over high heat in response to what I just said. And so I feel the instinct to pull back and offer some overly cautious advice right now, which is exactly what the pan manufacturers are doing when they tell you to never go beyond medium. And of course, if you use very high heat with any pan, you could fry your face off. I think that I have told this story before somewhere, so forgive me if you've heard it before, but uh, when I was much younger and uh, still watching tons of vintage British cooking shows all the time, because that was my thing, and that kind of explains <laughs> lots of things about the things that I make. But anyways, I was very young and watching tons of vintage British cooking shows, and I took the advice of one of those vintage British cookery chefs who uh, they told me to preheat my pan for 20 minutes over high heat before searing my steak therein. Dutifully, I did this. I preheated an empty pan for 20 minutes over high heat. And then I went to pour in a little film of oil to sear the steak and the oil immediately burst into flames flames up to the ventilation hood. I thought quickly and I put the lid on it, starved it of air, it went out. But there was a second there. <laughs> it was dicey. Oil will burst into flames when it gets hot enough. So this gets us to the second part of your question, Harmony. Why do recipe writers tell you to get your pan insanely hot? Well, consider who writes recipes. A lot of the recipes you're consulting were probably written by professional cooks. Professional cooks have historically favored gas cooktops because gas offers a lot of control. You can turn the heat up, you can turn the heat down, and it immediately responds. There's very little lag like there is with an electric stovetop. The pros have historically favored gas, and gas stovetops are, generally speaking, less powerful than high-quality electric stovetops are nowadays. My source for that claim is Consumer Reports. They've done some pretty exhaustive ratings of stovetops and ovens in recent years, and they have found that in aggregate, in total, gas puts out less heat than electric does. Or rather, gas gets less heat into your pan gas stovetops bleed 
way more heat out the sides and then into the room. It floats away and never actually gets into your pan. I have a video where I showed this with a, a thermal imaging camera. So if you're using a gas stove top, you might need to preheat that pan for 20 freaking minutes to get it hot enough to really sear that steak. On my electric stove, that was obviously way too hot. <laughs> Another thing to remember is that professional cooks are often used to having much better ventilation systems than normal people have at their homes. So even if you don't start a fire, really aggressive searing can make a lot of smoke. And that's a problem if you are cooking in a small, poorly ventilated apartment. I have forced the evacuation of an entire building more than once in my cooking life. I'm that guy, and I'm very sorry. So you can't always do what the pros tell you to do. Every pan is different. Every oven is different. You just got to learn your gear through practice. Be conservative. Accept that your dinner might not be perfect, but it's still going to be edible. And maybe you can push the heat a little higher next time and get better results without frying your face off. Matt Schultz asks, do you think there is any one experience someone should have before they are 30 years old? Any one experience you should have before you turn 30? Not everybody, Matt, but I suspect that most people will be better people if they have to take on responsibility for at least one other human life by around the age of 30 35 maybe. And that doesn't necessarily mean become a parent, but it does mean become a caregiver for some other human being who cannot fully care for themselves. Assuming that you are a person who is able to care for yourself and someone else. If you are not, don't worry about it. But if you are a basically functioning adult, I think that you risk arresting your development if you don't take on the awesome responsibility of caring for another person by the time you are approaching midlife. And I emphasize person, human. You may remember there was a little controversy uh, recently when uh, Pope Francis said that people who choose to have pets instead of babies are acting selfishly. This was, of course, kind of ironic, given that Pope Francis chose his papal name in honor of St. Francis of Assisi, who is the saint who loved animals. That was like his whole thing. But St. Francis also loved poor people, which is the real reason Pope Francis says he chose the name of Francis. But uh, anyway, people freaked out at this comment where the Pope said it's selfish to have pets instead of children. They read all kinds of sinister intent into that, and perhaps deservedly so. The Catholic Church does have a track record of encouraging what you could call self-destructive levels of overpopulation within Catholic communities. And they have encouraged this. It is shown in some historical records. They have encouraged this sometimes because they want Catholics to outbreed the Protestants or the Muslims or whomever the church was feeling threatened by that week. And the Catholic church is hardly the only institution to do this to encourage its own people to breed a lot, to bolster their numbers and make them a more formidable force. But um, the Catholic Church is the particular institution we're talking about right now because we're talking about the Pope's comments on pets. So that's why I mentioned that about the Catholic Church. Lots of people freaked out about these comments from Pope Francis, but I didn't feel like I could say anything at the time, but I kind of thought the Pope had a point. <laughs> kind of agreed with the Pope on this one. I have been that guy. I have been that overeducated, overfed, young urban professional with a dog and no kids. That was me in Boston when we lived in Boston. A dog allows you to feel all of the good feelings that you are evolved to feel as a psychobiological reward for caring for a baby. Having a dog allows you to get that good brain juice without actually doing the work of caring for a baby. 
Babies are more important than dogs. I said it. And I love dogs. I love them. Love dogs, but they're just dogs. Okay? Dogs are not as smart as we think they are. We mostly care for dogs for ourselves, not for the dogs. Okay? They're just dogs. I am a humanist. I believe that the perpetuation of our very, very special human species is and should be the ultimate goal of human endeavor. That doesn't mean that everybody needs to have babies. We are at a point where the perpetuation of our species is probably best served by everybody having fewer babies, not more babies. And indeed, looking at the global population trends, fewer human babies are on the horizon, and that's probably good for long-term human species survival. However, I think it's probably bad for most of us as individuals to not experience the awesome responsibilities of parenthood at some point before we get too old and too set in our ways. Now, believe me, it's bad to have babies too young, too. That's That much is certain. But I think it's really hard for a person to fully grow up without having the experience of being responsible for another much more vulnerable human's welfare. And parenthood is only one way of acquiring that kind of experience. There are many other kinds of caregiving, and I endorse them all. But yeah, Matt, I think most people would be better, happier people if they performed some kind of comparable level of human caregiving by their early 30s, let's say. I wish I'd had kids a couple of years earlier than I did. I think I frittered away a few years in my late 20s, neither doing anything very important nor having very much fun. I think I needed, at that point, I needed the focusing effect of awesome responsibility. And dogs do not provide anything like an awesome responsibility because as much as I love dogs, dogs are just dogs. People are more important. Howie Mandela asks, are you tired of hearing Rocky Top yet? Hells no. Love me some Dolly. Howie is referring to a, uh, a pop bluegrass song written in 1967 by Felice and Budlow Bryant. They were a husband and wife songwriting team. Felice and Budlow Bryant, if you don't know them, were a husband and wife songwriting team that wrote most of the hits sung by the Everly Brothers. Most of those tunes Felice and Budlow wrote. They also wrote a song called Rocky Top about life in the hills of East Tennessee, where I currently live. And it is the unofficial regional anthem. Rocky Top is everywhere here around Knoxville. I don't think it's a particularly great song, but the version of it I encounter most frequently is the one cut by Dolly Parton, and I love me some Dolly. Makes me real happy every time I hear that voice. And it would make me happy to hear your voice, dear listener. I have decided to transition this the Ask Adam podcast episodes, I'm going to transition these over to a voice-based format. I invite you to record your questions into your phone or whatever and send that file to askadamquestions at gmail. Askadamquestions at gmail. All one word, which you know because it's an email address. Askadamquestions at gmail.com. You don't have to send your question in audio form, but I will be far more likely to actually answer it if you send me a well-recorded, concise audio question that I can use in the show or a video question. This show does exist in a video format as well. So if you want to show me your beautiful face, uh, send me a video file. But you can also just send an audio file if you're more comfortable with that. Introduce yourself however you want to introduce yourself and be known to the world and ask your question. It can be about food, life, whatever. Personally, I am more interested in questions that are about you rather than questions that are about me, though I will endeavor to answer some of both. So yeah, send me a video or just an audio if you want. Please throw a quick written summary of your question in the email. That'll help me find it and organize my thoughts. Send all of that to askadamquestions at gmail. I will assume that anything you send me there is intended for publication unless you explicitly state otherwise. And I look forward to uh, seeing your smiling faces. 
just as I look forward to my morning cup of coffee tomorrow from Trade Coffee, the sponsor of this episode. I'm going to have this uh, coffee that Trade sent me. It is a dry process bean from El Salvador, i.e. beans that were dried inside their fruits. You get uh, lots of acidic, fruity flavors that way, and you know me. Uh, It was roasted by Dune Coffee Roasters in Santa Barbara. Yes, they are named after the book Dune for no particular reason. They just really liked the book, so they named their roasting company after it, and I like that. This is what trade does for me. They find me little independent roasters making cool stuff that I would never have found on my own. You go to uh, drinktrade.com slash adamshow, and you can take their coffee quiz. You tell them how you like your coffee, what you look for in coffee, and they find stuff for your tastes, stuff that has been tasted by their staff of professional tasters. How'd you like to have that job? Trade sends you your coffee in these compostable red trade bags, and there's a first match guarantee. If you don't like what they send you in the mail, they will take your feedback and a human coffee expert at trade will work with you and find you a new bag. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order, plus free shipping, when you go to drinktrade.com slash adamshow. Adamshow. Drinktrade.com slash adamshow. That is more than 40 cups of coffee for free. That link is in the show notes. Drinktrade.com slash adamshow for 30 bucks off. And do not forget about Mother's Day coming up. A Trade subscription is very giftable. Think about it. Thank you, Trade. Lonnie 440 asks, what do you think about Trader Joe's? I shop there a good bit and I've noticed it's a lot cheaper than its reputation. Thoughts in general. So hashtag not an ad. Trader Joe's is not the sponsor of this episode. Trade Coffee is and I thank Trade profusely for supporting my work. Trader Joe's, uh, for those who don't know what it is, is a grocery chain here in the United States that was founded by a guy in California named Joe Colombe, but it was bought in 1979 by a German guy named Theo Albrecht, who is much more famous for founding Aldi with his brother Carl Albrecht. And we have some Aldi grocery stores in the U.S., but as I understand it, Aldi is more than a grocery store in its native Germany. Aldi is a way of life in Deutschland. It is a brick-and-mortar manifestation of the post-war German national spirit. Aldi is bright and friendly, but still hyper-efficient. You have to put down a deposit to get a shopping cart, which incentivizes you to actually put the cart back where it belongs when you're done with it, and therefore the company does not have to spend money employing people to wrangle carts. Aldi, at least historically, did not advertise in Germany. They made a big show of not advertising, which you could call a form of advertising in itself, obviously, but they claimed they passed these savings on to the consumer. Aldi was cash only, back when being cash only was the more efficient way to accept payments, which of course it is not anymore, so they're not cash only anymore. You do have to bag your own groceries at Aldi, which, and that saves on labor costs. This is in very sharp contrast to the traditional way of grocery shopping here in the States, where checkout, when I was growing up, always used to involve at least two people. There was the cashier, and there was a bagger who engaged you, your mom, in leisurely conversation and perhaps helped you carry your groceries all the way out to your car. Aldi products have the reputation of being surprisingly high quality despite their discount prices, a situation that is made possible by economy of scale. They offer a limited selection of very good products. You get fewer choices, but you get better stuff for your money, at least in theory. This is a model that was imitated in the U.S. by Costco to enormous success. Anyway, Trader Joe's, TJ's. Trader Joe's is owned by the Aldi people. And because Trader Joe's tends to be in wealthy urban neighborhoods, it perhaps has a reputation of being overpriced. But as 
Lonnie observes that reputation is at least partially unfounded. Any number of independent analyses have found Trader Joe's to be significantly less expensive than, say, Whole Foods, which generally operates in the same upscale urban neighborhoods. Trader Joe's does a lot of that Aldi-style efficiency stuff. They're just a little less showy about it. I used to go to Trader Joe's sometimes when I lived in Boston. There was one near where we lived in uh, Central Square, Cambridge. And then we moved to Macon, Georgia, where there is not a TJ's or a Whole Foods. But uh, now we live here in Knoxville, Tennessee, where there is both Whole Foods and TJ's. And I have been hitting the TJ's pretty frequently, chiefly for frozen prepared foods. You can say a lot of bad things about Trader Joe's, but their frozen food game is on point. Like there's taquitos there that you put in your uh, tabletop convection oven that rhymes with uh, hair choir. And those taquitos from Trader Joe's are chef kiss. Frozen dumplings from TJ's, incredible. Really every frozen meal I've had from there has been on point. I would, in fact, like to do a video about how they make frozen food that is so damn good. I suspect there is at least some relatively novel technology involved, or at least just particularly effective deployment of modern flash freezing techniques. But I don't think I'll ever be able to do that video because Trader Joe's has a reputation of corporate secrecy. But if a PR person for TJ's is listening, uh, Call me. Trader Joe's is also an interesting nexus of conversation about the wine industry because Trader Joe's in-house wine brand is like the poster child of modern low-cost wine production practices that are very threatening to the traditionalists. The brand in question is Charles Shaw. They used to sell it for $1.99, so people called it Two Buck Chuck. It was a pretty good tasting bottle of wine for $2, and it's not that much more expensive these days. And they do things in making that wine like fermenting the juice with oak chips, wood chips inside the juice as it ferments, instead of the traditional thing, which would be aging the wine in oak barrels. And they do other things like that that uh, you know make all the sense in the world to me. <laughs> but are anathema to crazy wine people. Not all of those people are crazy. I shouldn't say that. There are, there are valid arguments on all sides of that debate, and I would like to do that video at some point as well. But those are my two cents on TJ's. The Portuguese Vino Verde that Trader Joe's sells for $5 does much to quench summertime thirst in the Ragusia household. I'll tell you that. It is called Esperal Vino Verde from Trader Joe's. Recommend. JP from OC writes, I'm wondering, how do you balance blocking out negativity while still taking into consideration valid critique? So, JP, on the subject of growing up, which we touched on earlier, I have sometimes defined the process of growing up as being one in which you come to realize why things are the way they are. Like when you're young and you don't understand why your parents act a certain way, then you become a parent and you're like, oh, oh yeah, I get it now. Totally get why they were doing that. Yep. Makes sense. Similarly, when you are at the beginning of your career and you find yourself totally outside of the power structure, you think to yourself, why are these idiots in charge doing things this way? It doesn't make any sense. And then one day you find yourself in charge and you're like, oh, oh. Yeah, I get it now. Yep. Got it. So I've had some similar epiphanies, JB, about the nature of fame ever since I became a micro-celebrity. I will never understand what it was like to be Michael Jackson in the fragmented post-monoculture media world that we live in today, I don't think that anyone will ever be as famous as Michael Jackson was ever again. And so I don't think anyone will ever understand what it was like to be Michael Jackson or Princess Diana or Elvis Presley. I think that kind of fame has come and gone. 
we have entered the epoch of micro celebrity. And my own experience in that world has given me what I think is the tiniest, tiniest little taste of what real celebrity might be like. And I feel like I totally understand now why celebrities be crazy. It is a profoundly unnatural way to live. It is a situation for which human character, human social habits are fundamentally maladapted. It might not be possible to be a good person while also being very, very famous. To your specific question, JP, a a problem arises where you get famous enough that every possible opinion someone could have about you, who you are, what you do, there's at least one person out there who has that opinion and they will try to make their opinion known to you. So for everything you do, everything you say, there are people who love it, people who hate it, everything in between and all around, at least one person for every conceivable reaction your own actions could provoke. The human social psyche is not evolved for this. We are evolved to live in small troops of like 12 closely related individuals hunting and gathering around you know, East Africa or wherever. And as such, we are built to be very sensitive to the opinions of others. If we are behaving in a way that is not best for the troop, the troop will let us know. And we will naturally respond very strongly. So now, the troop is just too big. Especially if you are a micro-celebrity on the internet. There can be no clear consensus among a troop so huge and so dispersed. So you, the micro-celebrity, you are left with nothing but a massive heap of irreconcilable conflicting data about what people in your community think about you. For every person who loves a thing that I do, there's a person who hates it, and they will all let me know about it. So what is a person to do in this situation? If you lack a strong internal morality you probably become a monster. Hence, celebrity monsters. They probably aren't people of particularly low character. They have ordinary character. But I think you probably need extraordinary character in order to be a celebrity who's not a monster. Because the normal social systems that enforce good behavior just don't work for you. Because your troop is way too big and way too dispersed. So you don't get clear feedback from them. You get massive conflicting feedback. And in my little micro celebrity bubble, I have had to lean more on my own internal motivations. I have to ask myself what I think is good. I have to ask myself, what do I believe to be good work? And I have to have faith that enough people will like what I like. The problem, of course, is that I could be totally wrong about what is good and what is bad and what is right and what is wrong. The other problem is that you could be totally wrong, too. Like, as I was compiling questions for this episode from the uh, user reviews of the Adam Ragusea podcast on the Apple Podcast app, which is where I got all of these questions from, I saw a comment there from somebody who was complaining that I did a whole episode reviewing the legendary Stanley Tucci food film, Big Night, without ever naming the film. This person complained that I talked about this movie for 10 minutes or something, they said, without actually saying the name Big Night, without identifying the movie I was talking about in the podcast. This is simply not true. Like I said the name of the film multiple times in the introduction to that segment. So on the one hand, it can feel from my perspective that all the feedback is just noise. But there is a concept from the uh, business school world where people who study customer service interactions and such, they talk about finding the truth in every complaint. 
If you're running a big business with lots of customers, people are going to complain about absolutely everything. And many of those complaints are going to be wrong. People will say, hey, I bought your product and it doesn't work. It's broken, but it does work. The customer just isn't like holding the on button for long enough to power it up. So the complaint is wrong, but you can still maybe find some useful truth in the complaint. If a lot of people are saying that, you know, your widget won't turn on, well, maybe that's an indication that your product design could be improved in some way to increase the odds that people will figure out for themselves that the power button is here and you need to hold it for three seconds before the thing powers up. Maybe your product could be designed to be more idiot proof. (laughs) The complaint may be wrong on its face, but it may be correct just a little underneath its face. So maybe the truth in that person's complaint about the Big Night episode is that podcasts can be made more listenable with the addition of more old-fashioned radio-style resets. When you do radio, people are coming in and out of the show all the time. There's decades of research showing that appointment listening is very rare with radio. People don't usually drop everything to go listen to their favorite radio show right when it starts at 8 o'clock or whatever. It's their lifestyle that determines when they listen. Whenever they need to be in the car, that's when they listen to the radio. And they stop listening as soon as they need to get out of the car. So because radio listeners are constantly dipping in and out of your show, you have to stop and reintroduce the show every five or 10 minutes to onboard all of those people who just started listening. You guys say, this is who I am. This is the name of my show. This is the name of the station. This is the name of my guest. And this is what we are talking about. That's called a reset. And I'm sure there are many other names for it among other people in the radio industry. If you listen to like NPR style radio, the kind that I used to make, This is why you will hear the host awkwardly addressing their interviewee by their full name in a way that doesn't sound conversational at all. They'll say something like, okay, now tell us, Adam Ragusea, what are your thoughts on the situation in Ukraine? Said absolutely no one ever. (laughs) When podcasting first became a thing, a lot of us radio people were like, hooray, we don't have to do resets anymore. Because podcast listening is asynchronous, meaning everybody starts listening to the show at a different time. They start listening at the time that is right for them. So everybody listens from the top, which means you only need to introduce the show once. Except maybe that's not really true in practice. Maybe people do dip in and out of podcasts for all kinds of reasons. And so they miss the part where I say, hey, we're going to be recapping the most foodie food movie of all time, Stanley Tucci's Big Night. And they naturally then assume that I never actually named the movie because they did not hear me name the movie because you know the dishwasher was really loud at the moment that I said that. And they didn't hear me say it, so they assume that something is wrong with me and something is wrong with my show. And then they go on Apple Podcasts to complain about it. <laughs> the complaint is wrong but I can still maybe learn something valuable from it. There could be truth within it, a wrong complaint. So anyway, JP, uh, the best approach that I've come up with for monitoring outside criticism of my work and filtering out the noise and the just emotionally traumatic stuff is to uh, look at the top comments on my videos, like the top rated comments. And I look at the replies on the top comments at least in the first few hours after the video goes live. If there's something really wrong or something that lots of people really don't like, I will be able to get that impression from the top comments or the replies to the top comments, and I can factor that into my thinking accordingly. And often I see people making complaints that I think are wrong, sometimes mass numbers of people making complaints that I simply do not agree with, but that doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. And even if I am right and they're wrong, that doesn't mean there isn't some useful truth in the complaint that I can learn from. Speaking of things that I do wrong, let's do failure of the week. This is the part of the show where I confess some misstep on my part for the purposes of 
entertaining you, but uh, also to normalize failure. That was a reset, by the way. And while all of my failures of the week thus far have been uh, recent failures, I think that I can uh, reach back into the archives from time to time, my personal mental archive of shame and regret. You know you got one of those too. I was, uh, I was writing a line in a script recently about meatballs. It was in the burger video from Thursday. I was writing a line in that script about meatballs and the act of writing, typing the word meatballs made me remember a meatball dinner I cooked about 15 years ago that I have tried very hard to expunge from my little archive of shame and regret in a dusty corner of my brain. We were living in Indiana and I had been uh, working on a recipe of pasta with lamb meatballs in basil pesto. Sounds good because it is good. And I was very much enjoying cooking it for myself and for Lauren. I had not yet mastered my pesto game at that point. I don't remember exactly what I was doing wrong. I do remember that I was using Thai basil from an Asian grocery that I used to go to in Bloomington. And Thai basil is very strong. It is also usually a little purple rather than green. And so I remember that my pesto did not look very nice. It didn't look very green. And this could have been because the Thai basil was purple or because the Thai basil was so strong that I didn't feel like I could use very much of it. And thus the cheese and the garlic dominated the color. Anyway, I had been uh, making this lamb meatball pesto pasta situation and really enjoying it. And I wanted to uh, share it with my grad school friends, Dave and Carla. So I invited them over for dinner. I am terrible at maintaining relationships. I am the worst friend because I don't call because I'm a hermit. And then I don't call because I haven't called. And I don't feel I can explain why I haven't called. So I don't call. We have talked about this before. Anyway, I, uh, at the time that this story takes place 15 years ago, I had uh, recently quit grad school. And so I was not seeing my old grad school buddy, Dave, and I love Dave to this day. So I invited him and his girlfriend, Carla, over for dinner to have meatballs with pesto and pasta. And as I was tossing everything together, I thought this does not look good. It smelled good, looked bad. It was a very drab color. It was no green. Pesto that is not green looks real gross. So what did I do? I reached for the green food coloring. Now I have no moral objections to food coloring. For my money, an order of tandoori chicken coated in red dye number five, that is one of life's great pleasures. But if you're going to put green food coloring into your pesto, you got to mix it into the pesto and then mix the pesto into the food. The inspiration to apply green food coloring did not strike me until the pasta and the lamb meatballs had already been tossed through the pesto. So I squeezed in a few drops of green food coloring and they did not disperse evenly. I had very noticeable little streaks and spots of obviously exogenous Christmas cookie green pockmarking my plates of meatballs and pasta. But Dave and Carla were at the door, so there was nothing to do but plate it up and uh, hope that nobody noticed. I am sure that they noticed. The difference between being 40 years old like I am now and uh, 25 like I was back then is not that I don't make stupid mistakes. I still make stupid mistakes. The difference is that now I am much more at ease with myself and thus I am much more able to confront my mistakes and, and joke about them. When I screw up a dinner party today which I do all the time, I laugh about it with my guests and then I shut up about it because nobody really cares that much and I get on with the night. Life gets so much easier as you get older, my friends. It gets so much easier in so many ways. I highly recommend it, getting older. Five-star review for getting older. Smash that like button for aging. Jing Hyung uh, writes, what's a foreign dish 
that you wanted to make yourself for a real long time, but ended up being underwhelmed by it or just not liking it very much? Well, uh, Jing Hyong, let's start by stipulating one of those things that is obvious but still needs to be said, and that is that foreign, as you phrased it in your question, foreign is a viewpoint-dependent description. If I describe something as foreign, I'm saying that it is foreign to me and my experience, not necessarily to yours. Indeed, just about everything is foreign to someone and not foreign to someone else. But the uh, foreign thing to me, foreign to me thing that I cooked and ate recently and was underwhelmed by would be tomb, salsat tomb, which is a uh, Middle Eastern garlic sauce or a spread, particularly associated with Lebanon. It is spelled T-O-U-M. And I'm sure lots of people will have lots of thoughts about the way I am pronouncing it, but uh, I've, I've listened to lots of people pronouncing it, and tum is the best I can do within a voice that feels authentic to me and how I talk. Anyway, tum, or tumya, I think it's uh, also called, is just named after the uh, Arabic word for garlic, and I love me some garlic, so I thought that I would love this. It's oil and a little lemon juice emulsified with garlic. Monday's video on YouTube is going to be all about the emulsifying properties of garlic, which are not super well understood. Really interesting. Anyway, I like oil. I like lemon. I like salt. I like garlic. So I figured that I would like tum, but I did not. I made it the way that uh, apparently is most often made these days, which is in a food processor. You put a, a ton of fresh garlic, like a lot of fresh garlic into the food processor. You whiz that up with some salt to get it pureed or just chopped really fine. And then you start emulsifying in a little lemon juice and a lot of oil, like four parts of oil to one part garlic. It's basically garlic mayonnaise, but without the egg. And the resulting emulsion is, is like builder's paste. It is so thick. You could sculpt with it. It is totally plastic in the literal meaning of that adjective. In the food processor, tomb takes on a huge amount of air. And so it comes out very, very white. My hypothesis is that uh, that aeration process is facilitated by saponins within the garlic. Garlic has been shown to contain a lot of saponins, and saponins are these compounds that foam up when agitated in water, which is why they are named after soap, saponins. Anyway, my guess is the, uh, the saponins support the formation of bubbles in this emulsion when agitated by the incredible agitating power of a food processor, and you get this very thick, foamy white garlic mayo without the smooth custardy texture you get from egg yolk. And I found it to be kind of repulsive. <laughs> but remember that I don't really like mayo either. Um, and I did not say anything bad about tomb in the video that I made for this coming Monday. Because that video is not really about the recipe. It's about the science of how garlic can function as an emulsifier. And maybe people will say that I didn't make tomb the best way that it can be made, which is no doubt true. <laughs> I am certainly in no position to pass judgment on the stuff, having only had it once and having only had it prepared by someone who had never made tomb before, namely myself. But I'm all I've got, which is why I make the Adam Ragusea podcast, even though some days I'd rather make the somebody else podcast. <laughs> I'm glad that you want to listen to the Adam Ragusea podcast. If you would like to ask a question for a future Ask Adam, Take a video or record an audio file with your phone or whatever you got. Introduce yourself. Ask a concise question. Send the file to askadamquestions at gmail. And do me a favor and type a quick summary of your question into the actual email. Ask me about anything you'd like. Ask me about me if you'd like, but I would rather talk about you. So tell me about whatever is on your mind. You know, food stuff, non-food stuff, and I will riff on it if I feel I have something interesting or entertaining to say in response. So check out that uh, garlic emulsion video on YouTube on Monday. I think it's real good. 
If you are listening to this podcast on YouTube, uh, do me a favor and subscribe to the show on an actual podcast app. Podcasts are great. Highly recommend. The show is on like every app at this point. I've checked. So uh, please consider subscribing to the podcast on an actual podcast app if you're not there already. Leave a rating and review on that app if you can, if the app allows for such things. That generally helps other people find the show. And uh, yeah, talk to you next time.